Hello everybody, you're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. This is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news, we have a different guest on each week, we head over to the Rylight Zone for a short story and or some poetry, we catch up with Twanglin Jack Ford in the Oak Shed for a weekly album review, and we play local, unsigned and or independent music. As always, you can find us on Facebook, if you search for the Arch Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. We repeat on Wickham Sound on Monday nights, we're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again on iTunes, Spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. I particularly want to hear from poets, performers, musicians, anyone with MP3s to share, anyone with local arts news, anyone who thinks they'd be a good guest. Don't hesitate to get in touch. So this week we're going to be chatting to the band Chameleon, but before we do that, we are going to head over to the Rylight Zone for the latest instalment of Formerly, The Rise and Fall of a Social Network. This is a novel by myself, Dane Cobain. We have been uh, serialising it in recent weeks, so if you've missed an episode, you can catch up on, on all of the catch-up things. Uh, you can also find it in ebook, paperback, and electronic formats on Amazon and everywhere else. So, formally, The Rise and Fall of a Social Network. Chapter 22. Nate obeyed his orders, and I started to receive a steady trickle of information, which I recorded in my journal. Apparently, John and Peter had been talking about China and Peter's sketchy acquaintances over there. According to Nate, John wasn't happy with the way things were going, but Peter stood his ground. No resolution was reached, and that's when the conversation abruptly ended and they came walking out the door. At least, that's what Nate told me. Since I had no reason to doubt him, it's what I had to go with. I hadn't learned anything new since then, but that was about to change. He'd sent me a text to say he had some news and arranged to meet me at a coffee shop. I didn't have long to wait. Let's get down to business, Nate said, as he slid into the seat beside me. I just want to get this over and done with. Sure thing, I replied. Now tell me why you brought me here. What do I need to know? The president has joined formally, he said, his eyes darting to the doors and back. I got an email that John sent to Peter. He said he wanted to step up security and to have a dedicated server for his profile. That's pretty big news. Can you get me a copy of the email? Way ahead of you, he said, passing me a crumpled printout from a plastic folder. I'm checking all of the bins, but you know what they're like. They're not the type to leave a paper trail. John shreds everything, and I don't think Peter even knows how to use the printer. But they're not immune to everything. I have my ways. Keyloggers, backdoors, and that sort of thing. How does that work? I asked. Basically, it registers every keystroke and every click, then transmits it wirelessly to a receiver. Then, I just filter through the data and reconstruct whatever it was that they were doing. I see, I said. Just get me what you can get me, Nate. I'll do the rest. He left shortly afterwards, and we both made our separate ways back to the office. A couple of days later, formally held a press conference, which was live-streamed across the internet. John started the announcement with his co-founder to his left and an American flag billowing in an artificial wind behind them. They were broadcasting from the boardroom, but we weren't allowed inside, so we had to watch it around the kitchen table on a MacBook. Ladies and gentlemen of the world, John began, staring straight into the barrel of the camera and right back out at the viewer. Thank you for joining us today on what is a historic day for formally and for the world. John paused slightly for effect and then continued. Formerly has been through a lot to get here, and we're committed to staying at the top of our game. We know that the wisdom of the masses often outweighs the wisdom of the few. We're also hiring, and we need the brightest minds of our generation. So we've devised a little game for you. Peter? He gestured for his co-founder to take the lead and step backwards slightly to avoid the limelight. Thanks, John, he said. Much appreciated. Now, as you guys know, we take data protection seriously. If our users don't trust us to look after their data, then they won't use our service. It's as simple as that. We already know that we have some of the best security on the market, and we're pretty confident in our ability to repel attackers. However, it could always be even better. Peter paused to take a sip from his glass of water before continuing. The other two men stayed stationary, and the flag continued to billow in the breeze. Beside me, one of our junior programmers stifled a cough. So here's the deal, Peter continued. We want you guys to try to hack us. You name it, we think we're ready for it. Whether we're talking about DDoS attacks, security flaws, or database compromises, we want you to find out about it. And why are we doing this, Peter? John asked, leaning forward slightly. Well, John, I'm glad you asked. We're augmenting our developer team, and I think that you'll find we can offer something that most of our competitors can't. Excitement. Let's face it, everyone and their dog wants to work for us because everyone and their dog is talking about us. Formerly he's the coolest kid at school. So how do people get the jobs, Pete? Perhaps it seemed natural to the thousands of outsiders who were watching, but I knew that this was just the latest act in the John and Peter show. They'd rehearsed this, for sure. It's easy enough, he replied. If you want a job, you've got to earn it. 
We want you to do what you can to break our site, and then we want you to help us to fix it. We take our users' security seriously here at Formally. If there are any vulnerabilities, we want to know about them before anyone else does. Oh, and guess what? We'll handpick the best bug finders to come and join us here in Palo Alto. We're going to change the world together, folks. You heard it here first. The response from the public was phenomenal, and we quickly took on a dozen of the best bug finders to help us to deal with the fallout. Our servers were taking a pummeling, a heavier pummeling than we'd been expecting, but we were still agile enough to avoid going under. One of the bugs was so serious that an attacker gained admin access to the database, and another could have compromised unencrypted login details for all of our users in Germany. Luckily, we were able to get the bugs fixed with no long-term damage. We still didn't have enough programmers, but we were struggling to find the right talent in the States. Luckily, Peter had his eyes on China again, and he was working on setting up a second office in the Middle Kingdom. China is calling, Peter explained, as he announced the news to a packed crowd of employees. By now, we were meeting in the garden because it was the only way to fit everyone in the same place. It was nice to sit outside in the Cali sunshine, even in the winter, but there was a darker side to it. Niels and his armed henchmen were never far away, a harsh reminder that the two founders didn't trust us. Over half of our bug finders are from China, John explained, and it's also our fastest growing market. We're one of the few Western companies to have cracked it. Setting up shop in Beijing makes perfect political and practical sense. Think about it. We can provide a better service for our users, and we can recruit some local talent at the same time. Precisely, said Peter, and it will help me to score some brownie points with my contacts too. It's a no-brainer. We've talked it through and there's literally no way that this could backfire on us. Even money's not an object. If we burn our fingers, we burn our fingers, close the office and swallow the loss. Ladies and gentlemen, formally is taking over China. That was the latest instalment of Formally, the rise and fall of a social network for this week's entry into the Rylight Zone. You're listening to the Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain.
That was Here Is All We Need by Chameleon. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and it's time for us to be joined in conversation now by Chameleon. My, my first question is one I ask everybody, which uh, you may or may not have an answer to. Uh, I interview a lot of writers, so that's where this kind of comes from. But uh, what was the last book that you read and what did you think of it? Oh, the last book. I, well, I'm uh, so the last book I read. Uh, oh bollocks! What was it? It was the first Lord of the Rings book. Oh yeah, Fellowship of the Ring. Yeah. Well, I do a lot of. I travel a lot on the train for work, so mm -hmm. um, I get like ten minutes, twenty minutes every day. Um, and yeah, it's the thing was I'd read it the last time I read it, it was sort of sixteen. Yeah. So it's quite a while ago, and it kind of, it was. It's just such an amazing book. You know the, the whole concept. I know it's. You know, some people, it's not for everyone because it's mm. very long winded and stuff. But I just love the way that he's like slow. It's a slow build and he, everything is put in place. Yeah. And, you know, the, cause, you know, I'm not massive into fantasy stuff, but it's just like it. But it's more it's kind of more than that. It's like it's like folklore in itself. Yeah. And the fact that it weaves all these different things in and I just find it so it's just fascinating. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Good choice. OK, so obviously today I want to ask you a little bit about the band. I thought a good place to start would be uh, where did you guys get your name? How did you decide upon the name? I thought you'd ask me this question. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I, so basically, um, when we started the band in 2007, the original singer, Louisa, I remember she rang me on the phone and um, and we were sort of chatting about what we wanted as a band name. And uh, we thought about we started thinking about animals. It's like some brainstorming mm. thing, and then uh, then we thought, oh, a chameleon, because we wanted a band that was with the band. We were kind of going down this sort of jazz improvised route, and um, and so we wanted something that reflected the the fact that you know chameleon changes its skin color to fit the environment and how it feels, mm. and um, and uh, so that was what. And then actually, kind of then it lined up with. Uh, there's a song by Herbie Hancock and the Headhunters called Chameleon. Yeah. So kind of that all kind of lines up, you know. Yeah. Uh, but that wasn't intentional. That kind <laughs> of was a was a fringe benefit kind of thing. Awesome. And who's in the band and what what roles do they play in it? Okay, so we've got um, Norwood on drums, um, my brother Oshan Owens on bass. Uh, got uh, Andy Challoner plays keyboards. Uh, Natalie uh, McFarlane, she sings and plays saxophone, and I'm David, and I play the guitar. Uh, I also occasionally do singing if Nat can't make the gig. <laughs> but yeah, cool. And um, like, what does the recording process look like for you guys? Um, it's sort of it's varied. So over the years, we've kind of done it on a. It's always on a shoestring, basically. <laughs> so it's kind of, it's been. Um, so the last two EPs, what the, the so the last one we went to a studio uh, in Reading, the name escapes me. I'm sorry, I forget. <laughs> it was such a long time ago now, um, and that was a sort of a rush job, really, uh, two days, you know, um, and and then the previous one was a live recording. We did a gig at Northern Farm in Maidenhead, mm -hmm, yeah, and we recorded that one. That was like an acoustic thing. So, um, so that was, you know, that was kind of uh, our then drummer, uh, Andy, he did the, he did the mixing for that as well. So, so it's all kind of ad hoc. Cause I'm, I studied sound engineering at university. So we've always tried to just do it ourselves, very DIY and with varying degrees of success, basically, <laughs> you know, so, cool. um, yeah. Awesome. And how many like albums, singles, EPs, et cetera, ha have you got out? So. The ones you could find, there's probably two, but there's there's a whole load of stuff on SoundCloud. There's definitely like an EP's worth of stuff on there, and then some extra bits. We, I'm a big fan of the Grateful Dead, and mm -hmm. they put out a lot. A lot of their a lot of their culture around them is this sort of this sort of live recordings thing. Yeah, yeah. So I started anything that I I used to. Re I record rehearsals and stuff and I used to go through the tapes and pick out improvised bits and just stick them on SoundCloud just so that there was something there so I think realistically there's about three EPs but two of them are sort of readily available yeah 
Yeah, that's cool. I mean, I, I read a book from you know, um, about 10, 15 years ago now, and it was called Marketing Lessons from the Grateful Dead. And basically, ah, yeah. the, the, the people behind it, like they're big, because I used to work in marketing, so that's kind of how I came across it. Um, but they were talking about how the Grateful Dead had pioneered a bunch of stuff. And one of them they were talking about was kind of, as you were saying, they used to have their, uh, they had, they'd have the zones by the stage where people with their recorders yeah. could go along and record it. And they were saying it's yeah. basically like, it's kind of like the 1960s, 1970s, whatever, like equivalent of torrenting and file sharing and things like that. And it's kind of <laughs> like the, op the opposite of Napster. Uh, so the opposite of Metallica who were like suing Napster, the Grateful Dead were like, yeah, come along, buy our music. We want as many people to hear it as possible. Um, so I think that's like a, a pretty cool little legacy they've got behind, and it's kind of it's kind of cool how that's shaped what you do as well. Oh yeah, no, no, with, um, I definitely in favour of that thing. Because the other thing is that you know it's expensive to make recordings. Yeah. So, and you're and you're out there doing them, you're doing it anyway. So you might as well make a tape of it. Yeah. You know, and just and i that's why i liked about their ethos with the whole thing is that it's kind of you know it's like a one off event mm. and a lot of the you know the stuff that we do it, there's an improvised element to it yeah and it's it's become it's gone you know like t peaks and troughs with it kind of thing and we're in a kind of we're very in an improvised section now but it's kind of so it means that it you know that if you come to more than one gig of ours the although the the songs would be familiar there's the bits in between would be different yeah and that is and i'm very much into that yeah so yeah it's uh and that that must keep it like keep it fresh for you guys as well right when you're like practicing and gigging and stuff it's kind of you don't end up i don't know like being i don't know like robbie williams who's 25 years on is singing the exact same version of angels or whatever like every time is different oh that's it and and you actually it's what's interesting we've had so many different people in the band and my brother and i are the only original members of the band so we've had so many different people and it's like and it's the way the songs have they change you know you change the drummer for instance and that completely changes the whole feel of all the songs yeah. and then sometimes some of those bits will you know they will then remain as like the arrangements of that particular song and up the feel of that song and then the next drummer will pick that up and go with it but it means yeah. yeah that it means it also means that you can't make any mistakes yeah you know because of, it, there's because no such the, thing no no they don't exist you know so it, it's it's very freeing you know yeah. there is no st structure we did go through a period when we had a set that was like 45 minutes long and it was tight but it was it was almost sort of scary that you know you kind of couldn't escape out of it there was no yeah. door to go out whereas now it's like we try and build in those doors so you can get out of the arrangement thing it's just being able then to get back in yeah you know cool so yeah that's that's the fun bit and that reminds me a bit kind of coming back to that first question where you were talking about tolkien and like folklore and it's kind of similar to that where like you have a folk tale and it changes with every retelling of it, but it's still the same story. It's kind of like an organic living thing. And I suppose kind of the same, same is true of your songs, right? They're kind of like alive in a way. Oh, that's it. I think that's definitely it. It's kind of, um, it's been able to, yeah, tell it different, tell, tell it in a different version every time. And yeah, there's always, that's what's, that's what's fun about it. That's why we do it. Yeah. Is that you've got that kind of, that freedom. And if it's, you know, if it's a, bad night or an indifferent night then it doesn't matter you yeah. know and it's quite the same way and it doesn't matter who you're playing to because if if the audience aren't into it if they're not reacting in the way you kind of want them to then it's fine because it's kind of like well there'll be a we'll just you know chat between ourselves basically yeah you know it's sort of it, it's uh it's that's how we like to do it cool and like th this is probably going to be a difficult one for you to answer but how would you describe your sound Oh, that is. Well, yeah, I've been having, I've been having a bit of a, a sort of a, a ponder of that with trying to promote the band, mm. um, because I, I suppose, it's sort of, funky is how I describe the <laughs> band, but not in, not in. Because personally, I'm not a huge fan of funk music. Yeah. But I like funk music, but I'm not. I wouldn't go out my way to listen to it. 
Whereas the other guys in the band, like my brother's a bit more as a bass player. Yeah, yeah. He likes that kind of thing a lot more. Um, but it's kind of, it's it's keeping that kind of bounce to it, you know, trying to keep it lively enough so that you can kind of, there's like a swing to it. Yeah. Um, but obviously it doesn't really answer anyone's question when, when they <laughs> want like a definitive answer. You know, when you look at a list, when you're filling out an application for a festival, and it's like, what genre are you? And you go down the list and say, well, I'm none of those things. Yeah. yeah. Or I'm because, you know, I, I, I've i said that we're a blues band, but we're not a blues band because we don't do that thing. Yeah. And then we're not a soul band because we don't do that thing either necessarily. But we bring we take elements from all these things. Yeah. And then we're not a jazz band because we we don't do jazz. But although we've you know got an element of that, maybe. Yeah. And then calling ourselves a jam band, which is. You know, in America, that makes sense because that, as a genre, exists. Yeah. Whereas over here, it's only certain people who would understand what that means, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So it's, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think as well, like, because when I think of, like, the term jam band, like, the way I think of it, and maybe this is because I go to a lot of, like, jam nights and stuff, but I, yeah, I yeah, just yeah. associate that with just sort of random people just playing, like, usually, usually blues, to be honest, but random people coming together, playing stuff. Like, as opposed to, like, a band that's got, like, again, like, original material and, like, a lot of improvisation and stuff like that. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know, a, a jam band, to me, and, and I totally understand, because, like, you would say, like, the Grateful Dead are, like, a jam band as well. Um, but I don't know, I, to me, I would automatically think, well, these guys probably haven't played together much and haven't been together long, and they're just, you know, showing that's, up on the night and being like, we'll come up with what we come up with. <laughs> that's an interesting, actually, that's a very good point. Yeah, maybe we shouldn't circle ourselves <laughs> that. Yeah, I never thought of it that way. Yeah, well, this is the thing, isn't it? It's, it's, it depends, it's, yeah. Yeah, it does depend. Yeah, it depends. It's because that's the thing. It's like, you know, it's where people are coming from, you know, where they've sort of, because the, the, the genre badge thing is kind of, you, it gives you an, you know, you get a preset idea of what, yeah. what that's going to be. Yeah. And, uh, and everyone's is slightly different, isn't it, you know? Yeah, cool, it's awesome. Stiff. You're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. I'm here in conversation with the band Chameleon, and this is Chameleon with It's Not Quite Me Now. Must be tired. Why is it so hard to sleep? Hard on fire. Shame the quiet on the street. On the corner, lamplight pouring at my feet Standing a day's head bowed in defeat Still in the air, pounding heartbeat It's not quite me now, but it will be Now, but it will be It's not 
That was It's Not Quite Me Now by Chameleon. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM with Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and it's time for us to be rejoined in conversation now by Chameleon. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you, again, like coming to performing live, do you have any particular venues that you really love playing at and that you'd you know, play at again and again? Oh, yeah, we play the Bellevue in Highwood yeah. an awful lot. We love playing there. The audience there are amazing. They give us a lot of time, and they put up with us a lot. And um, it's a, no, it's a really nice venue. We've played there a lot over the years. And uh, Noel and my brother have played there as well with other line of other bands. Yeah, and a kind of a fixture there and stuff. Um, we used to play in um, in a bar called Clayton's in Marlow a lot as well. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's changed hands now, but um, but um. That was also a nice place to play in a, in a different sort of way. Wasn't quite, you know, but it was, we had some great nights there as well. Some nice, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. But definitely the Bellevue for us is like home, basically. Awesome. Cool. And like you mentioned, like, uh, how long is it you've been together again, did you say? <laughs> well, the, the band, we started the band in 2007. But this yeah. band, this lineup of the band, I think, I'm not quite sure. I think it's about eight years. Yeah. Um. So when what because uh, Natalie Natalie joined us, and then and then Noel joined us after that, and then I think that was about eight years ago. Yeah. So and Noel did, had been once. Carry on, carry on. I was going to say like, how did you guys cope during the pandemic? Because a lot of the acts that I've talked to were either sort of just getting started or started like during the pandemic and stuff. So what what yeah, happened yeah. like with you guys going from you know being able to do what you want to suddenly being being locked down? How did you cope? Um, well, everyone had their own stuff to deal with. Uh, there were some health things. So people kind of just, we kept in touch. And I, I do the majority of the writing. So I thought, well, okay, I'll just use the time to try. And it wasn't very productive creatively, <laughs> really. Um, I found that being stressed and, uh, and, uh, doesn't really help with the yeah. creative process but no we um it was a bit disappointing because actually 2020 at the beginning of 2020 we'd lined up a whole load of gigs we played in some new places we played we played places like hey on y and things mm. and then i was like oh you know and there was seemed to be a momentum and then it all got chopped down from underneath us so it's slightly annoying but um but everyone's got families and stuff so it was kind of everyone kind of turned inwards and we kind of just dealt with the thing and just touch base every so often. Yeah. We thought about trying to do, um, trying to do Zoom or, you know, whatever rehearsals, but the, it just doesn't work as a, yeah. if it's more than two people, it just doesn't work. You know, the, yeah. the system isn't designed for it. So we, um, so we basically just hung tight and then we had, I had some, personal stuff at home that happened towards the end of uh end of the sort of the last bit sort of last year so that meant that we were i couldn't do anything apart from deal with the stuff at home yeah yeah so um so it was a bit like that really it was a bit sort of up and down and everyone had their own stuff to deal with the you know the guys in the band have got health issues and stuff um so they were kind of you know isolating and yeah just yeah. trying to keep out the way um and um, we had another baby and all this kind of stuff so it's all yeah it was yeah it was a lot of not really doing much with the band we yeah kind of went into into hibernation very quiet yeah. yeah basically yeah yeah okay um so just a few sort of random questions really what what does a good live show look like for you good live show yeah um uh People paying attention, band really on fire. Basically, it's <laughs> like when we feel when we feel good, and because a lot of the time, uh, I sort of I don't notice a lot of what the audience are doing because I'm trying to concentrate on everything else. And then occasionally I'll look up, and if I look up and there's like a, a few, fa you know, some some faces looking back at me paying attention. Yeah. You know, it's we. I uh, remember we played a gig in Eton a few years ago, and we thought it was going to be a bit of a disaster area. They'd kind of, the, where they'd left us was right at the back near the toilet. Yeah. And we started playing this gig and 
a hen party came in and they walked <laughs> all the way in front and they stood in front of us and they didn't leave and they danced to absolutely everything all the our own stuff any covers we did and it was just it was just really good you know and yeah. it's kind of one of those things where you feel like i can't do anything wrong i can't yeah. you know because they would they they'll they you know they're giving me the, the time that's what a good live gig looks like to me anyway Awesome, cool. And if you could go on tour supporting any artist, who would you who would you pick? Oh wow. Um, I guess with the different the different man, band members would pick different artists as well. So we'll go with who you would pick. No, <laughs> well, I'd pick. Yeah, well, I'd love to go. I'd love to go and support someone like uh, I don't know, like the Derek Trucks Band, the Tedeschi Trucks Band, or. Um, Anyone like that, really? I think it'd be fun to, or oh, like Robert Plant, that'd be fun. Yeah. Something like that, you know, someone kind of, I think, because that's, that's kind of our audience, yeah. know, those kind of people, you know? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And uh, other than music, what would you say inspires you guys? Oh, wow. That's a good question. Um, uh, personally, um, I do a lot of reading. I, um, I try and pay attention to things that happen around me, try and make mental notes of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes like if uh, I'll, uh, nostalgia inspires me a bit, you know, sort of, th you know, pondering about things and stuff that happens to other people in their lives. Yeah. I've written songs about that. So that, yeah, that kind of stuff, just sort of letting your mind wander a bit and see what it latches onto. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of being receptive to what comes your way as well, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Cool. Pretty much. Not trying to force it. Yeah, yeah. And and going back to like songwriting, and again, you talked about trying to write songs in, during during lockdown and was stressed and whatnot. And I wondered, like, what does the songwriting process look like to you? Um, you know, do you start with music? Do you start with lyrics? And um, you know, the question that everyone hates, but you kind of covered it. Like, where do you get your ideas? So I guess maybe that was part of the problem during lockdown that. That wasn't like real life was on hold, so a lot of that inspiration wasn't coming your way because nothing was happening. I think that I think that's true. Actually, I think the fact that we were caught up in a in the one building for the entire thing, and you know, it's I I listen to a lot of podcasts with uh, you know comics being interviewed and stuff, and you think, and they're all talking about the fact that you know no one wants to hear about it, so you mm. you don't bother, but. It, um, the writing process for me is kind of, I I have a book, I carry a notebook around with me everywhere, and I try and write words in it. Yeah. Because the the bit I find the hardest sometimes is words, and I I have to I have to have I have something there that I can work from. Yeah. And then what what I sometimes find happens is if you're writing something out, and then as you're kind of trying to figure out something some music you're not necessarily thinking about music to go with that but sometimes the two things line up yeah and you're playing something and you go oh hold on that will work with that idea i've just been because because your subconscious is yeah. tying the whole thing together so and for me i find that if i and i'd have to i kind of have to do it all the time i i was thinking you know i was thinking oh maybe i go through cycles of writing but i don't think that that's the case i think what happens is i just i that takes a little bit of a back you know back seat whilst other stuff is happening in life yeah and then and then i make it come to the forefront because i need need we need new material <laughs> yeah so you know um so it's like at the moment i'm I've, i'm in the middle of work i'm in process of working on a song but for me it takes ages because i've got you know we've got work and yeah i've got three kids so you know that takes up a lot of time yeah. So it's just trying to find. I, I, my son goes to karate on a Wednesday, and I for an hour. So I sit there at the back of the hall whilst he's going through his thing, and I try and write out as much as I can. Yeah. And go and I go backwards and forwards to the book, and then look for things and and expand on those. And then when I get another chance, I'll try and fit them together to the music, basically. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and the last question is technically two in one. So what have you guys got planned for sort of 2023 and beyond? And where can people follow you to stay up to date with you? Okay, so uh, stay up to date with us. You could go to Facebook or Instagram and it's uh, at Band Chameleon. 
uh, and it's the same for Facebook and Instagram. And from there, you can find the links to all the music and stuff. So the, the links are in there for the, the band camp page. Um, um, 2023 is, I'm working on 2023. I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm hoping we can put um, a recording together, a new recording together. Cause we've got some, we've got a whole load of, cause like I said about 2020, there was a whole load of new songs as well that we were that we were that we'd got into the set that we were going to go through and sort of use the playing live to hone the songs. Yeah, yeah. And so there's some stuff that never got past the rehearsal stage, and then I've got a few new songs that I I did manage to write over lockdown, um, that are finished that need rehearsing. So we've got enough for another EP basically, yeah. and I've got a plan to record it ourselves in in sort of bits and bobs. So I'm hoping 2023 will be new EP and then and basically just go and push it everywhere. I kind of been contacting people left, right and centre, but you know, it's kind of a slow process. And especially it's kind of I've been I've been starting now my you know on 2023 now and it's kind of still a hypothetical yeah. notion to quite a few venues. So um so basically it's gigging as much as we can and hopefully new recording if we can pull it together. Big thank you to Chameleon for joining me. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Chameleon with What Are We Waiting For?
as you wrestle the demon to the dirt Outside the cold light shines so clear Symbols are given the jungle don't apply here Sing hallelujah in a hushed tone Dancing in the aisle on the last train home Hold hands with a stranger saving and dying alone What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for?
That was Lively House by Betty Acorsi, and before that we had What Are We Waiting For by Chameleon. You're listening to The Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and it's time for us to head over to the Ilk Shed now to catch up with Twanglin' Jack Ford for this week's album review. George Gershwin, Rhapsody in Blue, Piano Concerto in F, and An American in Paris, and Porgy and Bess. A Rhapsody is a piece of music made up of unrelated themes, it is probably a good way of using up unused ideas. Easy come, easy go, little high, little low. Like side two of Abbey Road. There were two great rhapsodies in the 20th century, and whereas Freddie Mercury used his to look back at the grand operatic tradition of the previous century, Gershwin used his to chart the rise of the musical style that was to dominate all future popular music, jazz and blues. He uses the blue notes that seemed shocking to the highbrow music aficionados of the time. Those troublesome tritones, dominant sevenths and minor thirds played over major chords that have come to define soul, R&B and all kinds of rock music. He also made it sound urban. Unlike Aaron Copeland who wrote the sound of rural America, Rhapsody in Blue is the sound of Woody Allen's Manhattan. The final section is the sound of Hollywood. When it was performed at one of the Olympic Games opening ceremonies, it seemed like it should have been the national anthem. American in Paris is equally urban. It is the sound of traffic, car horns and busy people going about their business. The piano concerto does a good job of showing he could write a substantial piece without actually using up any memorable themes that might otherwise have been used in more commercial settings. I had considered just recommending Porgy and Bess, but though it is a celebration of African American music, the story is now regarded as quite demeaning and promoting a troublesome stereotype. The musical with dialogue has some great tunes, most notably Summertime, It Ain't Necessarily So and I Got Plenty of Nothing but the fully sung operatic version is quite tedious. Porgy and Bess, Rhapsody in Blue, Piano Concerto in F, and An American in Paris, all by George Gershwin. Big thank you to Twanglin' Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to Chameleon for being this week's guest. Thank you to everyone whose music I've shared. As always, you can find us on Facebook. If you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. You can email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. And we're repeated on Monday nights on Wickham Sound. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. So I'm going to leave you with one last tune, and this is Nothing I Can Do by Colin Upfield. I'll catch you next week.
Yeah. 